Hi. Party. Oh, okay. everyone's here. Hi, everyone. Hello. Cool. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Awesome. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know, we just had the Gatherly uh, poster session. So that was a cool experiment. Uh, and there were a good bit of people there. I, I enjoyed it. Um, so just uh, to kind of summarize, uh, we're going to have kind of the next panel and then uh, we'll have the last spotlight talk uh, after that. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with um, whoever's available uh, to discuss kind of future directions and, you know, uh, what are the grand open challenges that we want to uh, tackle in, in, in these spaces. Um, so I'm excited uh, to have uh, Phil Isola uh, and Ardi Singh uh, here with us uh, on the panel. And uh, I guess we can start with uh, introduction. You can kind of introduce yourself and if you want to give a quick elevator pitch of the video, which by the way, um, you know, the videos have been really popular. There's hundreds of views for each one of yours. Uh, so it's been great. Maybe uh, Ardi, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. First of all, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I haven't been connected with CVPR as much, but yeah, it was nice to get to know some of the other talks and stuff. So yeah, Absolutely. it's been great. Uh, so yeah, for those of you who may not know me, I am Arti Singh. I am an associate professor in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, broadly speaking, my research focuses on uh, feedback driven learning. So thinking about decision making and learning when you can, the algorithm is not just looking at data that has been collected passively, but is like thinking about uh, what are the right data points to collect, what's most informative and what's the best use we can make of data. So the talk I uh, prepared for this workshop uh, going with the theme of like limited data, right? I mean, I think my overall research direction aligns with that, but in particular, we focused on what are other ways beyond labels that we can get supervision for uh, learning algorithms. And so my talk was about like learning from preferences, which has emerged as an alternative way to get supervision, especially in scenarios where uh, coming up with labels or rewards is very expensive. Right, so many of us are familiar with how uh, there are several examples out there about how poor labels or rewards have lead to reward hacking and unsafe behaviors. So uh, thinking about alternate ways and humans find it easier to provide preference, right? Say uh, you're comparing, uh, instead of specifying a complex uh, reward for a robot, right? Just saying what action or you know, the sequence of behaviors is more appropriate, right? So that would be a preference. So uh, I focused a little bit on reinforcement learning, how we can do preferences, uh, preference learning uh, in that framework. But broadly, I also tried to give some overview of how preferences can help in other learning problems, including classification, regression, optimization, uh, right? So yeah, hopefully you had a chance to look at it and I'm happy to discuss it further. Great, thank you. Uh, Bill, do you wanna introduce yourself and kind of gist of your talk? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so thanks for inviting me to this workshop. Um, I'm my own research is really on all kinds of different ways of using limited or imperfect data. But my motivation for that is to understand biological intelligence, to understand human like intelligence, because I think that um, the way we learn, the way animals learn is from very noisy, imperfect, unlabeled data, you know, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning. Um, so I'm interested in all those things. Uh, my talk was on contrastive learning. And um, as many of you probably know, that's currently one of the really popular ways of doing unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning, um, where you uh, learn to associate signals which somehow go together, um, often just using supervision in the form of space-time co-occurrence, just, you know, an image and a sound are both caused by the same scene and you kind of learn, learn to associate those. Um, so in the talk, I went into a few of my own kind of current understandings of why and when does contrastive learning work. Um, so I basically shared three you know, very quick snippets. Uh, the first was that it kind of enacts some kind of causal inference about the underlying cause to a set of um, sensory measurements that if two sensory measurements co-occur, then you're trying to infer what was the thing in the world that caused them to co-occur. Um, 
that wasn't so technical and that wasn't all my own work, but that's just one of the ideas that's out there. And then I talked about two recent papers that we did, one on looking at how you can select for the, the signals, the views that will be the input to the contrastive learning. Um, so do you look at sounds and images or do you look at color channels and black and white channels? These are different types of sensory measurements that co-occur. And then the last was this geometric explanation in terms of uh, you're trying to take two measurements and align them on the hypersphere. Um, so this idea of alignment and uniformity as being good metrics of contrastive learning. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about any of those. Yeah. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, I don't know, I hear some background no noise. So for those who aren't speaking, if you can mute yourself. Um, okay, so let's start off. Um, so th there's, um, by the way, sorry, uh, the audience, yeah, put questions in the chat. Um, we'll start with the YouTube and other questions, but uh, if you want to ask a question, put yours in the chat. Um, so there's one question, um, I guess, for Artie, but I think maybe also is relevant for contrastive learning since there's very similar ideas of pushing similar things apart or together and different things apart. Um, so when asking for pairwise comparison annotations, how do you choose which samples to pair for labeling? Uh, does this have a large impact on the informativeness of the resulting annotations? Right, uh, so it does um, in different scenarios in different ways, right? So uh, clearly like I think being more uh, informed about comparisons can first of all, uh, not only can it help with reducing like the number of direct labels you might need, if at all. So uh, in my talk, I talked about two sets of problems. In classification and regression problems, you need, in addition to comparisons, you need some labels. Whereas in optimization-based problems, uh, whether it's uh, convex, non-convex optimization, or it, it is uh, policy optimization for reinforcement learning, do only using preferences, right? So not only is the choice of comparisons informative for, um, you know, just, been more careful about when, even when comparisons suffice, right? But also in settings where uh, you are optimizing the label complexity, right? How many direct queries you might need, uh, choice of comparisons can still be very meaningful, right? Because you cannot ask a lot of comparisons. Ultimately, we are talking about human judgments here, right? So people are limited in how many um, comparisons they can provide. And uh, if you look at some of our results, right, they sort of look like, okay, you can get a huge gain from comparison measurements, right, uh, um, in terms of reducing the label complexity, but it comes at the cost of assuming a lot of comparisons. So it's super important to be, right, uh, essentially like not incur the cost of dimensionality or uh, increase the burden too much on the humans, even if it is easier to provide comparisons. So uh, yes, choosing those is very important. A uh, simple example uh, maybe is think about ranking. So if we want to rank a bunch of objects, right, and uh, we want to do that using pairwise comparisons, if there are n objects, there are n square comparisons, right, that you can potentially get. But if you are more intelligent about it, then you can do it with n log n, right? It's a simple uh, sorting sort of idea, right, that you don't need that many pairs uh, to sort the objects into a ranking. So that's probably the easiest way to think about it. But then, like, yeah, there are corresponding analogs for other problems as well. So are there active learning kind of methods where you can just have unlabeled data, for example, and try to under understand which pairs to select? Um, so in a, yes, yeah, so active learning, yes, right? I think that I try to think about anything that has like the sort of feedback involved in deciding the next set of queries based on previous queries, as opposed to beforehand deciding which comparisons to take as, uh, as active, right? Whether it be in a labeled context or not. So yes, feedback is definitely important, right? Even this n square versus n log n, I mean, the way you get that improvement is precisely by being careful in the sequence of comparisons you choose, not just saying you have a random snapshot of n log n, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, and I guess, Phil, I, I don't know. Um, I know in, unsuper you know in contrastive learning, there's a whole literature on kind of maybe choosing the positives and negatives. Um, maybe you can say something about that, the importance of that. Yeah, um, so definitely there's, I think a lot of work on hard negative mining or well, right now there's a lot of interest in getting rid of the negatives or the explicit negatives from contrastive learning because there's a big cost in having to um, have these huge batches of, of negative examples. And uh, I haven't 
followed all the latest, but I think you know there's work coming out on how to do hard neg negative sampling so that you can more efficiently approximate a large batch of negatives. But there's also work that's more like just get negatives implicitly through mechanisms that to me don't um, fully make sense yet. I think the field is still trying to understand that, uh, BYOL and um, some of these methods that uh, get you, you know, the effect of having some pressure to separate representations so you don't get a degenerate um, mapping where you're only aligning positives and everything could go to the, you know, zero vector. Um, but yeah, so that, that might be related that they get negatives in an implicit way that um, might be more sample efficient. Is there, I guess, a way to tie that into some of the like, information theoretic or other kind of ways of thinking about it? Yeah, well, I, I just thought there's one question here, which is, um, does the geometric explanation give us more efficient ways of doing contrastive learning? And I think that's that's related. So um, what we did is we kind of decomposed the contrastive loss into this alignment term and this uniformity term. And the uniformity term is the negatives and the alignment term is the positives. And now, if it turns out that the, the goal, what, you know, what matters for the representation is just mapping to a space where everything is uniformly spread out, um, where the embedding vectors are uh, marginally uniformly spread out, then maybe there's you know, more efficient ways of doing that than with pairwise terms that try to push everything apart. So I haven't thought too much about what might be more efficient ways of doing that, but, but I do think that what people are coming up with and Boyle and um, uh, Barlow's twins, and there's other you know methods that might give you a uniform distribution, you know, more compactly, maybe batch norm. Okay, sounds good. Um, so there, there are some more uh, online questions, but I'll, I'll there's I see one from uh, on the chat, so I'll ask that uh, to Phil. Um, does your mutual information sweet spot depend on the downstream task you want to solve? I think the minimal and sufficient representation is strictly related to what you want to predict. Distinguishing a dog from a truck is much different from distinguishing two species of very similar birds. Yeah, definitely. So that, that explanation, um, the precise explanation requires knowing the downstream task and for whatever downstream task you have, there's some optimal set of views that will um, only share information about that downstream task and that, you know, under certain conditions that would be exactly the, the views you want because they would capture the sufficient statistics for the task and nothing more. Um, but you have to know what the task is. Um, so I think that that whole explanation, that whole theory is kind of, it's, it's half of the story. It's like, well, you know, it tells us how view selection might affect your performance on a downstream task, but it doesn't tell you how to solve a new problem where you don't know the downstream task, where you don't know, know what the good views are for that downstream task. Um, so yeah, you're, you're certainly right that that explanation is task dependent. Uh, what I think might be interesting, an interesting possibility is that there exists a whole family of tasks for which um, there's a generically good set of um, views that are kind of a sweet spot for everything that you, know, you might care about as a robot or everything you might care about as a internet um, bot. Um, I mean, it depends on what you're, what, you know, what you are. Are you a human? Or are you a self-driving car? Um, and I guess there's a, actually the YouTube question is related to this. Um, so the question says, uh, the idea that aligned and uniformity uh, in representation space generalized across tasks and domains seems pretty powerful, especially when we don't know the downstream task a priori. Um, can we perhaps use these metrics to dynamically explore the multi-view augmentation space, i.e. use the metrics to guide something like auto-augment during contrastive learning? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so I think you can only go so far because so the alignment term says pick all of your, whatever your augmentations are, let's say that you're cropping images and you're changing the colors, and it's saying, take all those augmentations and map them to an aligned representation. So um, an invariant representation with respect to those transformations. And so 
of course, if you have fewer such augmentations, it will be easier to get this aligned representation. So I'm not sure that the alignment term is kind of a task specific term. I think the uniformity term is maybe a little bit more general purpose that uh, you want, if we can embed onto a hypersphere into a normalized space, then uh, what might be just universally good or good for a whole family of tasks would be to achieve a uniform distribution over those embeddings. Um, and that might not depend as much on, you know, what invariances you want to capture, what equal variances you want to capture. It's just, you want to spread out, you want to have this kind of max entropy distribution on, over your representational space. Is there any role in, in terms of augmentation? Like maybe, I think the yeah, question was also saying like, maybe you can uh -huh. use these metrics to kind of decide between, you know, the hundred, list of hundred augmentations that auto augment has. Maybe. Um, so it might be the case that some augmentations uh, will lead to more uniform um, representations or distributions of representations. Um, and yeah, maybe augmentations can go wrong if they make the learning problem so hard that you can't achieve uniformity or maybe that you can't achieve alignment. So I don't know. Um, I think it's a little tricky because there's also, this is not the full story again. Like you could probably come up with a set of like trivial augmentations where it would look like you're doing really well on these metrics, but it wouldn't be good for anything. Um, like just turn off, you know, the top left pixel and you can learn a representation that's invariant to that, but that's probably not a good representation. Um, so I think it could guide you to a degree. It could tell you, oh, my representation collapsed. It's not uniform. It's not a good representation, but it's not the whole story. Okay, makes sense. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, so yeah, the the um, I saw that kind of the value of information for pairs um, for Hardy's uh, talk. I guess one, one question I had is, um, I think you say that the kind of equivalent between labels and pairs, um, but is that like a accounting for like the complexity, like how many? Obviously, like if you have, you know, n pairs, like you said, or n labels, that gi that's giving you all pairs of information, right? Um, yes. Like your, your comparison. So does that mean that if you only have comparisons, you have to have like much more of them in order to get the same kind of value of information as labels? Or is there something more complex than that? Yeah, maybe let me clarify. So I think order-wise, they are the same because, right, I mean, you can take two labels and you get a comparison out of it, right, essentially. So right. order-wise, uh, and of course, that, that doesn't imply that you can get same information in different problems, right, as we said. For optimization, sure, you only care about where the optimum is. You don't care about the value of your function necessarily. In that situation, you can just do comparisons because all you need is sort of like the gradient and comparisons provide you like the sign of the gradient, essentially, right? So that's the uh, only information you need. But if you care about like in classification or regression problems, you care about where that threshold is drawn, right? Where the decision boundary is drawn or what is the actual value of the function, right? Or another setup we looked at was threshold bandits saying which arms are above a threshold, right? Again, it's, I, it's, I think of that as also sort of finite uh, domain classification, right? Then in those uh, problems, you do uh, need labels, right? Comparisons alone are not enough. Right, like comparison will, the simplest example is think of linear regression, right? If I have, uh, if I tell you the gradient, let alone comparison, which is the sign of the gradient, right? Then you know the slope of the line, but you don't know the intercept, right? You still need a few direct labels to actually get the intercept, right? So it is, um, yeah, it is that idea. So I think it sort of depends on the metric, but at least we identified these broad classes of right problems where you care about the optimizer versus the actual value of the function in some way. And there you see a difference between comparisons and, uh, and uh, labels that comes up. Okay. So, I mean, I guess there's room maybe for a, like a mixture such that you yes. can, can use lots of kind of comparisons which maybe are weaker or easier to obtain and then you can combine them with a small number of like, real labels. Absolutely. So in fact, that is the message of our uh, classification and regression, the first uh, part and threshold bandits that yes, you should combine the two. So comparisons, if they are more accurate and uh, cheaper, can take away some of the burden, right? So you can lower your label complexity somewhat using it. 
Now we saw that even in optimization and reinforcement learning policy optimization, right? Where we um, uh, said that, okay, you can actually replace labels completely with comparisons. That's only true if you assume your comparisons are coming from the same function that generated your labels. Now that may not be true, right? In many scenarios, uh, your comparisons could be provided by a different person who may have a bias than the one who is giving you labels. Or uh, your labels could actually be the result of a measurement device, right? You're actually putting a sensor out there and measuring something as opposed to asking a human for judgment or comparison, right? So it, actually in the uh, GP optimization context, we did study what if there is a mismatch, right? Your um, labeling function is different from your comparison function. Can we adaptively figure out when to use comparisons versus labels? Uh, so even in optimization problems where you technically don't need labels, but of course, if there's a mismatch, right, uh, you can you still can um, yeah leverage some small number of labels to overcome any misspecification bias. We show how to adapt to it, at least in that scenario. We haven't looked at it in reinforcement learning. So I think looking at hybrid uh, feedback in reinforcement learning is still, I think, uh, yeah, a very interesting direction to look into. And I guess is there, there, I assume there's also just like the characteristics of like, um, given labels, how much noise or what type of noise there is, and given comparison, I assume people are different in terms of their noise or, or their errors in terms of comparison. Yes, absolutely. Right. So different people can provide different uh, noise. Uh, in fact, we have looked at like quantifying a little bit, like how does it, what does that noise look like across people? And in fact, we had a recently submitted paper looking at this problem of that comparisons, right, in, in the work I talked about here, it was mostly we put all the comparisons together. We don't care about like who provided them and what could be the biases in them. But a specific setting where this comes up a lot is peer review. So recently, um, in collaboration with another faculty, we have looked at a peer review setting a little more where comparisons may be coming from different reviewers, for example, right, or, and on different subsets of papers, right? So you may not have the same provider providing the comparisons between all your objects, right? So looking at specific issues there and how to combine uh, such uh, yeah, comparisons in addition to direct ratings of paper, how can you take that into account? Yeah, we just put something out on that end. Okay, cool. And one thing I, I like about the, the relationship between your two talks is that they're very related in the sense that like, you know, one is kind of looking at direct kind of comparisons given by humans or others and the other is more kind of just like self labeled kind of comparisons like across augmentation, for example. Um, I'd like to pretend like I did that on purpose, but I did not. Um, so I guess, I mean, for, for contrastive learning, it seems like there's similar issues, right? Where essentially, um, obviously mixing labels and um, contrastive learning. Um, I think Rogerio uh, had a great talk uh, for few-shot learning showing that like combining these, these different losses um, gives you kind of a best of both worlds. Um, but there's also, I, I guess it's interesting because I, I've never thought about, you know, for example, this notion of maybe different self-supervised labels or auxiliary tasks provide different um, like noise or other kind of characteristics. Can you maybe tell, say, say something about that? Yeah. Um, let's see. So I, I missed where Jerry's talk, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting hybrids like we're very much in the area that I'm, um, you know, kind of working in. We're very much, we follow the rules of the game for whatever people kind of standardized on and decided, you know, in, in 2019, they do it this way. And the, the rules of those game, of that game, uh, are mostly you do unsupervised pre-training and then you fine tune or you train a linear classifier on top of your representation. But if you look at the whole thing holistically, you know, this is semi-supervised setting, and really there's probably more interesting ways of mixing the labels. Like we're always doing these hybrid things with some supervised labels, some unsupervised labels, uh, some things that are from natural signals, some are from noisy measurements. Uh, yeah, so I think it's really interesting to look at hybrids that combine all of those together. Uh, but we oftentimes get kind of stuck, I think, in these. You have to compare to the known setting, um, so it just takes a while to break it. Okay, makes sense. Um, I guess another question. Yeah, by the way, uh, folks in the chat, uh, feel free to put more mm -hmm. questions. Um, another question that I had um, maybe for Artie is, um, so it seems like, I guess you're making the argument that these pairwise comparisons are maybe easier or require, I guess, 
I assume like if you're quantitatively measuring this like time or something like that. Um, I guess, is there kind of like a trade off here where, I mean, like, I guess, is the benefit of pairwise comparisons when you account for like how long an actual person might take to provide these or, or maybe, I guess, the resources you need to get experts um, to provide labels versus um, the non experts that you can use to provide comparisons, things like that. Um, and, and I guess from your experience, is there like a positive kind of trade off there for using comparisons? Yeah, so I think uh, we do have to be careful that I think these results, and especially the theoretical results, should not be taken in the light of that it will work for any applied domain. I think we have looked at specific domains where the gain is significant, and there are other domains where it's not. As a concrete example, uh, so we did an experiment with, um, or a crowdsourcing experiment, I meant, with uh, asking people to compare like uh, prices of, uh, I think it was Airbnb listings, right? Like versus, so guess the price versus compare which one is more expensive, right? And there we actually see that because the information is a little bit visual and easier to absorb, yes, people do better at comparisons than at actually like having to read through all the details to come out and guess the exact price. But on the other hand, uh, there are setups, actually peer review is an, an example of that, right? Where it probably takes us about the same amount of effort. Like you have to understand a paper before you can either rate it or compare it. So there the uh, gaps are actually narrower. So I think uh, there are more experimental like applied studies needed as far as like, what do these uh, noise level accuracy levels, right? Look like in different types of um, measurements or yeah. Uh, elicitations, right? Uh, and what does it look like across different types of experts, as you pointed out, right? Like asking um, right, a, a layman versus an expert, right? Again, there are different costs. And uh, and I think part of the challenge there maybe uh, for me who uh, looks works a little bit, and I guess Philip also like we think a little bit more like uh, in a theoretical or foundational manner is when is that like, is it just about saying here's a cost and you take that into account? That's fairly easy. But I think the challenge is like actually s figuring out what that cost is and does it require a non-trivial modification to the algorithm, right? Um, I think some, some are easy, but I think some are harder. Uh, so even, even for actually um, maybe a related, not exactly the same remark, but a related remark for hybrid uh, feedback that we were discussing earlier, right, uh, is, um, one approach would be you say, well, I can always, um, you know, think of these as bandits, right? Like maybe different arms or something. And I want to adapt to like which one I want to actually pull, right? One is providing me with contrastive feedback, one is providing me with comparison feedback or whatever, right? And uh, we could do it that way, but I think you really need to look into a little bit more closely. Like, for example, even with comparisons and direct labels, it wasn't that easy. Right? We couldn't just say comparison is one arm because we don't get the magnitude of the function at all, right? Whereas with labels we do. So I think, yeah, really thinking about each one setting a little bit more carefully uh, presents new challenges um, that I think need to be discovered. Okay, cool, makes sense. Um, okay, I guess getting back uh, to contrastive learning, I guess um, this is probably a, a question you get often. Um, so your ge geometric explanations of contrastive learning as maximizing alignment and uniformity is interesting. Do you have thoughts about how one might leverage this insight to improve uh, the effectiveness of contrastive learning methods? Yeah, um, so I, I guess this is what I was um, starting to talk about earlier with, uh, okay, if we've identified that the negatives are um, maybe aiming toward uniformity or uh, you know, uniformity is a metric that's predictive of success, um, well, why don't we just optimize for uniformity um, and maybe this particular loss in the contrastive objective, um, you know, there's a lot of variations on it, but maybe they're not quite quite right. And there's a, there's a lot of um, cost functions that will encourage uniformity of embeddings. Um, so it, it's not clear to me that we we chose the right one, the most efficient one. Uh, I haven't pushed that myself, um, but I think that that's just okay. If we're optimizing, if uniformity is what we actually want then why don't we come up with a good way to optimize for that? Maybe it can be constraint, right? Maybe, I mean, this is kind of like the batch norm idea that uh, you just take your representations at some layer and you make sure they have unit variance. Um, and I know there was a little while when people were debating whether some of these contrastive methods that didn't have negatives 
might be benefited by batch norm. And now there's, there's some controversy. It's not quite clear. You can, you can also get rid of batch norm. It still works. But maybe batch norm is part of that. Or maybe there's other normalization that can be like a structural constraint as opposed to uh, you know, a cost function that you optimize for. Um, so yeah, that, I think this uniformity term is maybe the one that is more interesting. The alignment term is a bit more classical. Like that's, we kind of always knew that that's what we were trying to do, but it wasn't quite as obvious that uniformity is something that falls out of this too. So is there, I guess, a reason you haven't pursued it? Is it do you think it's, a, I guess, it's a difficult problem. There's lots of loss functions that are possible. Yeah. I guess um, they might have side effects, you know, negative side effects in terms of the other things that are important, right? Yeah, maybe. I think I just haven't had any special insight onto that. Um, uh, but I would encourage if anybody is an expert in this area and knows like how to do good distribution matching, I mean, it's not such a different problem than generative modeling or, uh, you know, we're always trying to match some distribution. And if it turns out a uniform distribution is the one to match, then um, we could probably apply a lot of techniques. There was one kind of follow-up to this alignment uniformity paper or related work that came out saying you can match an arbitrary distribution. It doesn't have to be the uniform distribution and other distributions might have other beneficial effects. Um, so yeah, once you think of it as distribution matching, I think a whole bunch of tools open up, but yeah, just for no, not enough time, I guess, is why I haven't received it. Yeah, I just didn't know if like, there's yeah. an estimate that it might be a really hard problem. I think it might be pretty interesting. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, say that it was, it was because it's uninteresting. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, the other thing is, I guess, yeah, one, one thing I really like about your work is obviously like, you know, looking at it from the perspective of mutual information gives us some kind of, you know, mathematical thing to latch on to. Um, do you think there's other kind of principles um, or do you think like information theory is like the main kind of principle here? Um, um, okay, so yeah, I think the information theory uh, explanation, I, I, I suppose for me came mostly through the CPC paper, the contrastive predictive coding paper, although uh, I'm pretty sure there's, uh, well, I know there's older just, um, InfoMax and um, information bottleneck and there's a lot of information theoretic like explanations of representation learning that are quite related. Um, but this info NCE loss introduced uh, in CPC or articulated as info NCE in CPC was influential to me. I think that's one part. And then there were a whole bunch of people that have pointed out that, oh, you know, information theory is not a full explanation. It clearly can't be. There's this great paper from, I think, Google Brain Zurich, where they said, um, you know, here are cases where you can, you can get representations that have good information theoretic properties, but are degenerate or terrible. The raw data itself, uh, it has the maximal amount of information. So, so if you just wanna have your representation capture as much information as possible, you shouldn't do anything. <laughs> you just go with the raw data itself. So clearly, you know, uh, there's more to it than just information theory. I think that's, but, but I don't think that means that the information theory is wrong or not part of the explanation. It's just not, um, uh, sufficient on its own. Maybe it's necessary or maybe it's one part of the explanation. Um, I guess one that I've been getting more interested in is causality. And for me, that's currently at the level of just an intuition and a nice story and noticing that it appears all, going all the way back to the Becker-Infington 1992 paper, which is, to me, it's like Sinclair, but, uh, but in 1992. Uh, and of course, Hinton did you know, Sinclair as well, so it's not a surprise. Um, but in the abstract, it's like, this embodies causal inference. I don't think they proved anything. It's not formal, right? But that makes a lot of sense to me. I think making a formal connection to causal inference would be really interesting. Uh, you have some kind of causal model of how the signals are generated. Of course, this is a little different than I think what RT is talking about, where the, the signals are coming over there, maybe from comparison or human judgment. Or I think what I'm referring to is the case where the signals are sensory measurements of the same underlying scene. So we, we have some constraint on the generative process, the causal process. And if we make those assumptions, then maybe we can say precise things about causal inference. Right. Okay, great. Yeah, I was actually going to ask Artie about, like, I guess, the role of some of these things like information theory and causality and kind of your analysis. Of, um, yeah, so I have a, yeah, I have a, a like, a um, kind of a, a, like, a practical question is actually uh, asking maybe both of you. So. Um, so you, often, like we have, like uh, you know, like uh, we work on something, um, like uh, recognizing uh, 
some disease, you know, from the images, uh, you know, because you take some pictures of people's eyes, maybe you, you, you can find that people might have some disease. And this kind of data sometimes is very uh, limited in a sense that, um, you know, so, so you start uh, with a new kind of project, you often you start with like a small data set. And then um, like, uh, how do we actually, um, you know, so we actually going to uh, basically, for example, you, you train our models, uh, with certain group of people, and then you suddenly you're going to collect like a new set of uh, data that looks uh, like a, a lot different from what you do. So usually, um, what can we actually do to basically uh, mitigate the the gap? I mean, between the two distributions of the data. Yeah, so I guess you're asking about like essentially, um, I mean, this could happen at any like, training and test time, right? You get different distributions or even when you're starting off. So yeah, I think ideally, uh, to me, a big goal is like bridging the gap between like, the small wo data world and the big data world, right? Like our models do not have to start out complex, right? Somehow we should be able to build in complexity as we get more data and leverage like all possible sources, right? Of information that are available, right? In whatever form. Um, now, thinking about representation learning in that context, I think has been a challenge, right? Like I haven't seen any clean solutions to that. Uh, ideally I would want to do, I start with very few examples, maybe they're even all from one class, right? And maybe uh, there are very few and the new classes come in and I build my model to accommodate those. And then I identify whether it's a new class versus the refinement of a current class, right? And, and, and I might make mistakes and I need to go back and fix those. So. It is a, overall a very challenging problem, right? Um, and yeah, I would love to, I, I think that's why like, if you think about, okay, why does active learning like not really work for things like neural networks or as complex models is because representation learning, we, we don't know how to actively learn representations, right? I think that's really part of it. So I think what you're talking about like shifts and so on detect, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of pieces to doing this uh, small data to big data transition, right? First, we have to detect whether there is a shift right, and that the shift is meaningful and then be able to adapt to it. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll pass it on to Philip if he has the... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a, it's like the key question in machine learning, right? Um, how do you handle generalization domain shift? Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I'll, so I think Arthur was talking more about the adaptation side of that question, but there's also this side of just can we learn a representation that is invariant to the shift? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to adapt. And that I think is quite close to what contrastive, the contrastive stuff that, that I think about is doing. Um, and maybe connecting this again back to the causal inference, although I don't have really precise things to say there, but there is, um, some interesting work in, in, in variant risk minimization, um, trying to kind of say, okay, well, we want to learn a representation that will um, maybe be invariant across some set of domains um, so that it does, the lighting conditions won't change your representation. And, uh, or just, I, I suppose um, there's a lot of ideas of just learning representations that are robust against some set of changes and in contrastive learning this alignment part is is creating a representation that's robust against a certain kind of change the data augmentations that we put in there okay but now maybe we can think of it more as let's learn a representation that's robust against across environments or subpopulations or tasks um you know something more than just data augmentation and, and that that seems like it gets really interesting um just another interesting paper that starts to look at that is this one, what should not be contrastive and contrastive representation learning from, I think, Toto Xiao and uh, folks at Berkeley. Oh, maybe um, Trevor Darrell might've talked about this today. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, uh, well, let's learn a representation where it can transfer to multiple different tasks so that different subspaces of that representation capture different invariancies that will generalize to different scenarios. I think that's kind of interesting as well. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I think uh, I can talk about this uh, forever because I, I really enjoy these topics. Uh, but I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks. I thought that was a great discussion. Um, and definitely a lot of interesting open questions here. So it's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.
Um, and now we will move to uh, the next spotlight, uh, which will cover kind of oral papers as well as uh, the challenge that Kyle can talk about. Um, the only thing I will say is uh, there's a lot of slides here, so let's try to keep it kind of four minutes per uh, topic here. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, the first spotlight talk uh, is unlocking full potential of small and diverse super data supervision. Is the author here? Uh, yeah, here. Okay. Great, and yeah, just uh, tell me uh, when to advance the slides. Okay. Uh, okay, so I guess we can start now. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So thank you for your interest in our work and looking the full potential of small data with diverse supervision. Uh, 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 first of all, wait a minute. So uh, our slides contain some uh, animations. So can I share my own screen? So maybe the presentation will be more- uh, Sure, uh, you can try. Fluent. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, can you see it now? Yep. Okay, cool. So thank you for your interest in our work, unlocking the full potential of small data with diverse supervision. So we know that data plays a critical role in the success of future learning. It is common to assume the existence of a large scale data set. The dominant paradigm at the moment is to train a feature extractor on a base set with a sufficient number of samples and then fine tune the classifier on the future novel set, as can be seen from the figure. The data set supporting visual learning have also increased significantly in scale from CUB mini image net to the recent meta data set. Both the number of images and the number of classes in these data sets have grown. So the success of such visual learning methods requires a huge amount of training data, but such kind of big data does not always exist in real world applications. So in this work, we start such scenarios calling them small data regime. For example, in domains such as face recognition and uh, medical imaging, it might be hard to collect many training examples due to the privacy issues or the equipment cost respectively. Uh, so we propose to simulate this challenge, which we call SCUS image by subsampling images from the base training set at random. And uh, another type of challenge comes from the imbalanced distribution of real world data which means that the TIL classes are hard to identify and annotate. Adapting to this kind of cases is critical for applications like autonomous driving. So therefore we propose this SCAS class setting to study how the absence of real classes might influence the generalization abilities of the model. Uh, so to simulate this challenge, we only keep the top 25%, 50% or 75% of the head classes in the training set. And uh, our approach of enhancing the performance under the small data regime is to leverage the diverse supervision. So on the left of the slide, we show an image of a scene from ADE20K. Then on the right, we demonstrate various annotations provided for this image. For each instance, such as the door or the table, there are attributes, segmentation masks, and the paths are labeled. Uh, we follow the standard approach for facial learning evaluation in particular, we first train a facial extractor, such as the ResNet, on the base set with all the classes and images. And then we fix this facial extractor and fine tune the classifier on the facial novel set. Uh, we introduce additional source of supervision and uh, add individual branch and loss for each supervision type. The supervision sources can be classified into three groups. Uh, the self supervision, which manipulates the original image image level supervision, which operates on the official map level, such as segmentation, and the object level supervision, which concerns the official vector, such as attribute classification. Uh, so in this slide, we show the potential benefits of learning with diverse supervision. The red line represents the performance of the model trained with all the data. 
namely all data baseline. Uh, the gray bars are the accuracy of the models trained under either SCAS class or SCAS image settings. And the blue ones correspond to the models trained with diverse supervision. So as can be seen from these plots, introducing diverse supervision can help match and even express the baseline performance by only using 50% of the classes or 75% of the images in the base set. And uh, so that's all for our presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you okay. for your presentation. Um, okay. So the next is uh, PLM, if you want to share or I can share. Uh, if possible, can you share? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I am Kevin, and I'll be presenting a partial label masking for imbalanced multi-level classification. Next slide, please. So, so the problem we're working on is the uh, learning from imbalanced data. So real-world data sets often contain long-tail class imbalance, where a few classes have many samples and several classes have only a few samples. Usually when training a classifier on such data sets, uh, they perform quite poorly on these tail classes. Uh, next slide. So, so this is not the, the imbalance between the number of classes for different uh, is not the only form of imbalance. There's also an uh, imbalance between the ratio of positive to negative labels for each class. So, so head classes tend to have this a, a larger ratio of positives to negatives than tail classes. Uh, what what this causes is uh, classifiers to underpredict for infrequent classes, as seen in the uh, graph on the top. Uh, where um, classifiers predict very low probability scores for those tail classes, even though the class is present. Um, and it also causes classifiers to overpredict the frequent classes, as seen in the graph on the bottom. Yeah, next slide. So our approach uh, attempts to reduce this imbalance between positive and negative uh, samples uh, by masking the loss computation uh, for the different classes, such that we can have a set number of uh, positives to negatives for each class. So, so if we look at the sample uh, distribution of classes for the multi -MNIST, imbalanced multi MNIST data set, uh, we can see that um, if there's a class with too many positive samples, when compared to negative samples, such as you know class zero, we can mask out some positive samples or labels. Uh, whereas other classes which have too many negative labels, we can mask out their negative labels to get a one-to-one -one ratio of positives to negatives. Uh, next slide. So our approach is simple, but it's general. It could be applied to almost any uh, loss which sums over the classes. Um, to do this, we first begin with just a standard loss formulation where each class is, uh, each loss for each class is computed separately. Um, and summed over the classes. And then we apply a mask, G in this case, uh, to the losses. This, this mask is binary. So it, one would uh, denote that we're going to use the loss and zero denotes that the loss is masked or not used. And this mask is generated stochastically to ensure a set ratio denoted as R hat is seen by the classifier during training. Um, so next slide. Uh, so the question becomes, how do we select the ratio for a given class? Um, we set the ratio based on the classifier performance. We attempt to uh, minimize under and over prediction for various classes. Uh, for more specifics, I guess I'll point to the paper. Um, but generally what happens is the head classes, which start off with a high ratio, uh, are decreased th during training because the network over predicts those classes, whereas the tail classes uh, the ratio increases during training because the network tends to underpredict these classes. Uh, next slide. So as you can see uh, on the left hand side, we have a uh, standard network trained using binary cross entropy, uh, which I showed previously. And on the right hand side, we have uh, the network trained using the partial label masking. So uh, generally, uh, partial label masking allows the network to underpredict less for those tail classes. Um, and overpredict less for the head classes. Um, yeah, next slide. 
Um, so, so this leads to a general improvement on, uh, on, on uh, evaluation data sets. Um, and there's an especially large improvement, a large improvement on the tail class of the class of the few samples. So we can see as the imbalance increases for, you know, uh, artificially imbalanced SIFAR 10 data set, um, the accuracy for the classes with the fewest number of samples, the relative accuracy improves. Um, okay, next slide. And this improvement is also seen in the multi-label real-world data set MS Coco. Um, so as you can see, the tail classes, we have general improvement over the top uh, 15 uh, or the, the 15 classes with the fewest number of samples. And also the method improves on classes uh, which are difficult but have many samples as seen on the left-hand side. Um, uh, so yeah, so next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you for your interest in our paper and uh, please, you know, read the paper and watch our longer uh, presentation on YouTube. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next paper is the author here. Yes, I'm here. Sorry? I'm here. Okay. Uh, do you, is it okay if I share or you want to share? Yeah, you can show. Okay. Kick it up. Yes, next. Next, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, label noise and explanation. Uh, why uh, new explanation? Why uh, regularization of the outputs mitigates label noise? And so first. There is a branch of method that deal with the robust losses. Uh, they are appealing because you only need to replace uh, the loss functions and then you mitigate label noise. You don't need to deal with architecture and so on. Next. Next, please. Another uh, option is to use a confidence uh, penalty. Uh, and in this talk, I want to make connection between confidence penalty and uh, robust loss. Next. So the contribution is two, is a novel uh, theoretical explanation for the success of regularization and mitigation of labor noise. And this uh, explanation is based on the fact that many times the uh, losses become asymptotically symmetric. Please next. Next please. Okay, so a few notations. Uh, the data is represented with X, Y represented the labels, Y bar represented a, a noisy labels. Uni we talk about uniform noise and, uh, noisy labels. Um, we have L, capital L, which represented the expected loss, capital L bar represented the expected of the noisy loss. Um, and uh, in general, a loss is said to be robust if the minimizer of the expected noisy loss is also a minimizer of the expected loss, or at least they have the same prediction. Of course, a sufficient condition for this that if you minimize the expected loss, you minimize the, the expected noisy loss, you minimize the expected loss. Next, please. So, Symmetric losses, uh, losses that uh, if you sum the output over all the if you sum the losses over all the possible labels, you, you get a constant. This is called symmetric loss. There is no that is robust to a label, to uniform label noise. There are a few examples for this. Few, because total symmetric losses usually don't perform so well, so people invented the uh, uh, losses that have become a, a symmetric only asymptotical. And now we will show that a confidence penalty actually have similar behavior. Next, please. Okay. I now uh, introduce a new uh, type of loss. We call it a multi-category unhinged loss. Uh, it's based, it's, it's a generalization of a, a binary and unhinged loss, which in turn is based on the famous uh, hinge loss from SVM, 
the only intention in the proposing of this loss is to for the further analysis that we will have. Next, please. Okay. Uh, so the the MUH is unbounded from below. It makes sense to bound it from below, and uh, it, it makes sense to add regularization to it. And in general, we can say this lemma will show that uh, uh, if you add the regularization to symmetric loss, you more or less stay robust. You just the minimizer of the regularized loss is is also the minimizer of the, to the unnoisy loss with stronger regularization. Next, please. Um, yes. So here we show that MUH, this theorem show that the MUH loss with quadratic uh, regularization is, uh, is, is actually totally robust. Next, please. And uh, intuitively, uh, this lead to asymptotical uh, robustness if the, if the gradient in zero is uh, equal to the gradient of the MUH. Uh, next, please. Next slide, yes. And we are very interested, naturally, we are very interested in the soft cost entropy and we can see that this that for example, the Christopher cross entropy has the gradient and zero like the MUH loss. And that's led uh, to asymptotical robustness. Uh, we have some problem because uh, 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 with the confidence penalty, we don't have minimum uh, at zero, but on a line where all the outputs are equal, we can solve it by uh, forcing, uh, uh, forcing one of the one of the entries to be zero. We do it by subtracting the output from each other. Next, please. So, in summary, we propose a, a new concept concept of asymptotical robustness. We show that the, the asymptotical robustness exists. Um, we introduce the MUH loss, a byproduct of this. Uh, I, I missed it because I was too fast by the byproduct of uh, this uh, theory is that we show that the square loss is uh, robust in some form of it. Um, and we show that the uh, cross ent entropy can be asymptotically robust to label noise. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I guess uh, Kyle can talk to the challenge. I don't know if you want to share your screen or. Uh, oh yeah, let me. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, and he'll talk about uh, uh, specifically the localization challenge as part of the workshop. Yeah. So, uh, so hi everyone. So basically, uh, we actually organized the localization challenge. Um, there were like a basically uh, four tracks uh, in total. So the first tracks. Uh, we basically looking at uh, uh, weekly supervised semantic summations. And then this track basically um, targets learning to perform the object semantic summations using only the image levels annotations as a supervisions. And this is like a, basically a data set built um, uh, using the image detection track of ImageNet um, data set. So in total, there were like a, a 456,000 uh, training images from 200 categories. And then we provide the pixel levels annotations of uh, uh, 15,000 images. So validations, we have like a 5,000. Testing, um, uh, testing data set, we have like a 10,000. And then we host the uh, challenges on Eval AI uh, platform. So um, we actually hosted this challenge last year. So uh, this year, the winner uh, is, uh, Basically, the first team winner is uh, uh, from the Shuo Li, Zhe Hua Hao, Yao Yang Du, and then Fang Liu, and then uh, Li Chen Jiao from uh, Xidian University's IPIU lab. So they result is, uh, um, they got a pretty good result. Pixel accuracy is uh, 86. Um, and then the mean uh, intersection of unit is uh, uh, 46.06. Uh, um, 
is actually slightly uh, better than the second place uh, uh, from Tianjin University. Uh, and then the third place uh, is from JD, um, uh, J I think it's from JD.com, and then also collaboration with uh, Nanjing Universities. So the result is uh, 39.68. And then if you go to the website and then you click the link, you will see that the uh, result. And also, you um, so basically the leaderboard is here and you can see the test result, um, which is here. Um, so this is like the, um, uh, so this is the winner um, based on the mean intersection of a union. And then you can see the second place is uh, from 10 universities. Um, well, they're very close uh, between the first one and the second one. And then you can see that uh, also that the rate result is actually substantial improve over the uh, number one result we got from last year, uh, which has the mean intersectional union uh, 40, uh, 45 point um, one six in mean uh, intersectional union. And then um, yeah, there were other uh, submissions as well. And then uh, you can also see the um, the validation uh, submissions where they basically rank according. To the result, so the number one is obviously is the um, like the ground truth. We actually trying to make sure that the ground truth is correct. So for the ground truth, you get uh, like everything is one hundred percent. And then um, so for the, I mean for the validation set, it looks like um, Tianjin University has actually got a, a much better result, but not on the uh, test uh, data set. So they will. Um, so we also have. Um, one of the teams actually uh, provided the uh, uh, talks about um, about their works. Um, I'm wondering if the audience has the uh, others. Do we do we have the uh, others uh, here for for these uh, challenge submissions? You mean the top? Yeah, this is the top uh, result. Um, so they actually prepared the slides. Um, uh, I mean, the method they were using is called a do uh, self-training for weekly supervised semantic sentation with noise label. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if the audience um, uh, have anybody is actually from this team. Uh, if not, uh, we can, yeah, maybe we can quickly uh, scanning through what they do. Um, so this is yeah, I think what, what are some of the other teams do you have slide or, or I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I have the slides for the other team as well. Yeah. Um, so in the interest yeah. of time, we can. Yeah, maybe we are, we are, we'll definitely upload this uh, slides uh, to um, our website and then uh, you should be able to, uh, everyone should be able to check it out. Okay. Uh, so that's the first challenge. And then the second challenge, uh, let me close this one. Yeah, so the second challenge uh, regarding the, uh, basically this is a challenge we uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Alibaba, or, which is the, one of the largest uh, e-commerce company in the world. So the task for this one is a weekly uh, supervised product retrieval. So given a photos uh, containing multiple product instance and a user provided the descriptions. Um, so this track basically aims to detect the objects, uh, basically detect the box of each product and retrieval the correct single product images in the gallery. So there are like uh, um, basically um, uh, quite a huge data set. It's like a more than 1 million on uh, real world product photos. Uh, and then uh, each photo contains uh, 2.8, um, three uh, products on average. And uh, corresponding to a user provided uh, uh, descriptions and a single product galleries. Um, that is a data set uh, um, where you have uh, four, uh, like a 40,000 uh, images for evaluation. Uh, basically evaluating the retrieval performance. Um, and then we also have the leaderboard. Um, so the winner um, for these challenges uh, is, the, is the, uh, the teams um, from uh, Joy AI Research. Uh, I guess it's a, a startup. Um, so the team member's name is uh, uh, Bao Jun Li and um, Gen Xing Wang, and then Jia Mian Huang, and then Tao Liu, and then Zhi Wei Shi, and then Zhi Meng Wang, yeah. And then the other teams from uh, Sun Yan-sen uh, universities um, and then certain places from Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, so uh, we can also uh, see the whole result, um, which is hosted on the uh, basically code lab. Code lab um, and then, uh, yeah, so, the, uh, so we got like uh, six teams of uh, participants and then, um, 
yeah, the first teams um, got a pretty good result uh, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the mean um, average recall at 10 and mean average uh, precision at 10. So you can see those metrics, they are um, pretty, uh, uh, they're better than the, uh, they're actually, uh, I think they're significantly better than the second one. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then, um, yeah, so this is the result. And then we also have them maybe contribute to the uh, slides as well um, to elaborate the method. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, uh, any audience have, um, like if, if we have the audience uh, from this team can present their slides. Okay, if not, um, yeah, so we will definitely share these slides. Um, and then, uh, so I, I, I can just uh, quickly uh, go, we, we can quickly go through the slides here. So this is basically the problem setting. So you want to uh, find the products and then um, this data set is pretty big. And I think they using, um, oh, they actually using the vision transformers and then BERT to win this challenge. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is interesting. And um, so they're using self-supervised vision tr uh, transformers. Uh, so they're using the, I think this is a Facebook uh, detection backbone. Okay. And then they do some uh, self distillations with no labels. Um, uh, so it actually hits all the uh, keywords of this uh, workshop. So contrast the learning of a sentence saying that is here as well. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. I guess, yeah, again, in the interest of time, I think we can just put it online and we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, they actually, apparently they did a lot of the results. Uh, it's not easy to get the top result uh, on the leaderboard. Um, so yeah, so congratulations to them. Um, and then the, uh, and then the next task, um, yeah, so the track three is uh, also weekly supervised object detections. And then, so this track basically uh, making classification networks to be uh, equipped with the ability of object localizations. So we also make use of ImageNet uh, data set um, where we actually provide the pixel uh, levels annotations of uh, 44,000 uh, uh, images. Um, and then we also hosted the challenges on the, uh, uh, on the EVA AI. And then the, um, I think the winner is, uh, is from JD.com. Uh, so apparently they win this challenge. Uh, I mean, it's in collaboration with the Nanjing, Univers uh, Nanjing University of Science and Technology. So the peak uh, IOU they got is uh, 0 0.697. Um, and then the second place is uh, Yon's uh, CVPR. And then uh, they result is 0 0.55. Um, so you can actually see um, this challenge's result um, by going through the uh, link. So apparently they were, um, Oh, actually, they. Uh, I think there was some problem with the leaderboard, but uh, yeah. But this is the team actually got the winner. So um, I think I have the. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we ha will have time. Also, because we're starting the next panel. Uh, oh yeah, so we are. Uh, we're going to share these slides, and then uh, yeah, I think uh, this method mostly using uh, CIM, and then uh, using the state of art uh, method to address this, and then maybe I just uh, briefly um, talk about the on the last uh, track, which is a high resolution human parsing. And then the winner team is from um, uh, from like uh, uh, the collaborations from BUPT and the BIT and the ETH, uh, Z and the Baidu. So they result is, um, so this is a challenge is trying to uh, recognize the human party parts uh, with a uh, high resolution images. Um, and then the um, best method, I actually got the mean average precision, um, which is 79.32. And then the EIOU is uh, 48.29. And then we also hosted the um, result uh, basically on the code lab. Um, so you can see the result is here. Um, there were actually a lot of people uh, trying to participate in this challenge. Uh, I guess the first one, yeah. So first one, uh, congr congratulations to them. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Cool, thank you very much. Okay, sounds good. Um, so yeah, we'll put up all the slides. You can see uh, how, how they won uh, the competition. Um, I see lots of cool transformer new things uh, in there. Um, so our final kind of thing that we're gonna do um, is just kind of talk about future directions. I think it's 
always useful, you know, for young researchers to see this and, and be inspired about like, what are the open fundamental problems? I'm actually really excited to see there's a lot of uh, members from the panel. I really appreciate uh, you staying uh, for the for the late uh, session. I, I know it's Father's Day as well. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of go around uh, and maybe I, I have a little bit of a summary I was going to uh, discuss kind of, of some of the future things that came out during the other panels, but um, I guess so as not to bias people, maybe we can just go around and, and uh, the panel invite our speakers and, and see what their thoughts are in terms of open, open, discuss, open issues and kind of fundamental challenges that we haven't solved and we, we should tackle next. Um, so I'll just kind of um, go down the list. I don't know, nobody's uh, putting their video on, so I don't know who's actually here. Um, so I'll just call down the names. Um, so maybe starting with Artie, since uh, your, your name starts with an A, so you're, you're on top of my list. <laughs> maybe, yeah, just fundamental kind of open challenges. Um, but, yeah. So uh, I think uh, we were sort of discussing it at the last uh, right uh, panel that we had. And uh, I think to me, yes, going between this sort of small data to big data, right, using all possible data sources, right, like uh, is still one of the most fundamental challenges that, uh, you know, we face out there. I know there are many sm smaller steps that we have to take on the way, but um, again, trying to think about, you know, coming up with, like if you think about the human brain, right? Like there's a representation that develops, right? And that also develops gradually from the time, right? Uh, a child is born, right? And then they start learning about the world, but then they are able to uh, do discriminatory tasks over that, like, you know, using not too many samples, but then they are getting lots of different types of feedback, right? They are getting, um, you know, information about what caused what, right? So causality came up as an issue, right? That we you know, haven't tried to leverage as much. Uh, as well as um, uh, the different types of feedback about like whether it's, uh, they, they don't just get like labels for everything, right? Like they, they get uh, gestures or relations, right? Uh, thrown at them, right? This thing might look like that thing uh, and they develop some of their own similarities. So really thinking about like all possible ways in which we can use information uh, to learn a representation and then try to do, you know, tasks well on top of that. Um, so to me, like, I think that is the most fundamental uh, open question and, and tackling any part of it, right? Uh, ranging from like thinking about, okay, we already had the representation and now we want to, you know, adapt to newer classes or distributional shifts. That's like one piece of it, but then going all the way back to like, we also want to learn the uh, representation from scratch, um, how to put all the pieces together. That's great, yeah. Yeah, so, someone who does some robotics, uh, yeah. We, you know, think that everybody's very fixated on labels and things like that. But really, if we want to like naturally teach a robot to be a various like means of of annotation, that's like you know, on the fly and natural. Um, I think that's a great point. Cool, uh, Alex, you're here. Yes, I should be here. Um, yeah, I think one of the big challenges for me, as I also, I guess, kind of alluded to in my talk is um, how can we um, avoid having to labor that much um, and, and still uh, learn good representations? I think I, I hinted at that in my talk as well, right? There is this entire industry of, of click workers now. Uh, which are essentially uh, just sitting there and labeling data. And they are uh, um, not, not doing too well. Let, let, let me formulate it carefully. And I think to some extent, we as a community contributed to that. And I think what, what we need to study and understand is uh, how can we avoid having to learn good representations just from uh, large amounts of data. Um, and so far we have, I think what we understand is, um, what we understand pretty well in, in our community is uh, learning from, from, from big amounts of data. I think it, it's fair to say if, if we collect reasonably large data sets, we, we can address the tasks that, that we care about, at least the, the, the basic ones. Um, 
but without sitting down and labeling all this data, um, we are uh, we are not there yet, I would argue. I think we're making progress, um, but far too often uh, is, at least according to my opinion, the easy route to just ask people to gather data. And um, maybe we, we shouldn't become complacent um, in, in just asking people to label data and instead um, try to address the research challenge of how, how can we learn better representations? And that could mean leveraging data that already exists. And I think RT hinted at that. Um, how can we transfer some sorts of labels? Um, I think there's, there's plenty of challenges there. Um, but to me, the really big challenge is trying to um, avoid having to label that much. Good. And by the way, yeah, I don't want to uh, enforce if anyone has thoughts to chime in. Uh, it can be a panel discussion as well. Um, okay. And then, uh, Booking. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, I, while I was listening to RT and Alex, um, I was. I'm not against people labeling data, actually, maybe because I'm, I'm from industry. The reason for me um, learning from unlabeled data or limited supervision is interesting is because we want to scale up our model's capabilities. Um, um, uh, maybe just perspective from industry, because when I was a PhD student, basically I worked on object recognition over only 31 classes. With that, I got my thesis, got my PhD degree, but soon we need to work on image light, and then we moved on to um, anatomist, like 5,000 classes, 8,000 classes. And uh, we also have instance retrieval and uh, face recognition, millions of labels in the data set. So I hope that one day we could have our visual world, all the visual knowledge abstracted into um, maybe not one neural network, but an ensemble of neural networks. But in order to achieve that, we have to solve the long tail problem because, and we scale up the instances or classes, naturally the power law will, will emerge. And we have to deal with the small sample problems with the sum of the classes, maybe actually a majority of the classes. So there are, we can do data annotation still as much as we can, but uh, even if we do that, we, we need to deal with the small sample of rare examples, infrequent uh, examples, and the limited supervision or ambiguous uh, labels there. Um, as Alex mentioned, how to learn generic and useful discriminative representations from unlabeled data certainly will be a road toward that. Uh, hopefully, we can achieve to a road toward that, that vision. Yeah, I yes. mean, I, it's not, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's actually, yeah, all from already, me right now. Oh, no, okay. I thought someone was chiming in. Um, yeah, I guess it's maybe not necessarily a different perspective, but I mean, um, it's either low labels or I, I think in industry often it's very large scale unlabeled. Um, and, you know, I guess you do get the long tail distribution as well. So um, I guess it's all of these combined, yeah. Um, I guess, let me see, sorry, uh, Guo Liang. Uh, yeah, um, I will discuss about uh, my opinion about the uh, direction of the adaptation uh, problems and uh, applications. Uh, so uh, in future, in my opinion, I think the direction should be uh, making the dumb adaptation techniques uh, other uh, weakly supervised algorithms more practical in uh, complex real world scenarios. Uh, as we see, papers published recent years have demonstrated uh, good numbers on various uh, domain adaptation data sets or benchmarks. Uh, however, the scenario in the real world may be more complex than the artificial benchmarks. For example, uh, imagine that. Um, a self-driving car is uh, driving to a new city. A uh, new city here means a city that the uh, learning system has never seen before. 
uh, you don't expect to take over the control of the cloud class new data and adapt uh, and try an adapted model. So uh, you may expect the car can uh, determine how to adapt itself. You may expect it can progressively improve its adaptation performance uh, with continuous incoming data and don't make uh, serious mistakes. So solving this problem may benefit from multiple techniques, but may not be a, a trivial combination. Uh, another challenge also an opportunity I think is how to use a uh, large amount of unlabeled data from the uh, web to improve the uh, domain adaptation or generalization performance. Uh, nowadays, we have access to large amounts of images uh, on the web. So how to avoid the negative effect of noisy data or uh, how to select the most effective or informative images to facilitate the domain uh, adaptation process I think it is worth uh, investigating. So uh, in my opinion, future researchers should pay more attention to the uh, specific requirements of real world uh, applications or scenarios and keep in mind uh, challenges we may, might, we may meet in practice. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, then Humphrey. Hi. Yeah, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, so I think one of the things on my mind and also uh, discussed in my presentation about escaping the big data paradigm with the compact transformers is that um, uh, I'm recently thinking about how can we safely and uh, meaningfully decouple like uh, modeling, compute and the uh, big data? Because essentially, how do we, what is the big data? I mean, really a few years ago, we still think ImageNet is a large scale. And uh, I mean, in the ImageNet challenge, they say it's large scale visual recognition challenge. But now we really, we, we're talking about like uh, hundreds of millions of uh, images or billions with the uh, weekly supervised fashion. And um, I think, I mean, uh, if we think about uh, like uh, the human or animal intelligence, like a smart crowd is a, is a very intelligent body and it can act, uh, behave uh, very, uh, cleverly and it can tackle all the real world challenges. It can cross the like the, the road in the traffic and it can do a lot of things. And uh, I think in our cases, um, we really need a way that uh, for the research community to uh, healthily decouple these things. And I mean, the research community is really great at uh, doing the modeling aspect, but the compute and the data aspect are better provided by big companies like watching at the Google probably have access to it, but we, we don't have that. Uh, for a lot of academic units. And uh, also uh, from society point of view is that without the accessibility, a lot of students and the people won't be able to reproduce this research. And we won't have this way to, to really to verify whether this is making sense. For example, we talk about a lot of great things after CNN, we have transformers, we have a MLP mixers, and a lot of results we're only reading from papers. We cannot really test it and also, we still start to wondering whether this is really a big advancement in modeling or it's really about compute and the scaling. And, and for this scaling is really about more data to capture our human experience or it's really about, I mean, there is a something significant there that is advancing our capacity. So overall, I do think that um, it would be great if we can find a way to try to decouple this in, in a good way. I mean, we want to models to scale. We want it to really to solve the problems for autonomous driving for other important applications so that we can uh, use it, apply to our real world scenarios. But also we want to research to move on to really solve the fundamental problems. So how to safely decouple these three components I think that's one of the things I really wish that we can uh, have to do as a community. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, and then Phil. Hey. Um, yeah. So I, I think I agree with you know everything that's been said, and I think one of the trends that several of us have mentioned now is um, let's you know see if we can learn from more data, cheaper data, and labeled data, um, you know, be opportunistic, use everything. Don't worry if it's labels or if it's preferences or if it's raw unsupervised data. Um, so I completely agree and I am interested in all of that, but I also want to go one step further and say that even all that raw data is expensive. 
even unlabeled, unannotated, noisy data in the wild is expensive, and that has cost too. So one thing I'm currently very excited about is, can we just get rid of data entirely? <laughs> okay, I have to explain what I mean by that. Um, so I, I mean a, a few things. So one is get rid of data by replacing real data by replacing it with synthetic data. Um, so that synthetic data could come from a 3D graphics engine. That's kind of a classical way of doing it, which is still, you know, needs more investigation. But also it could come from a generative model, which I think is, is very cool. Now we have these models, right? They're really compact. The model for ImageNet is a gigabyte. ImageNet is 250 gigabytes. This is so much more compact a copy of that data. And it's a better copy of that data too, in some respects. It's more organized, it's continuous, it's differentiable. So I'm really excited about that. Like just, can we use synthetic data that comes from a model? And then the more extreme version of this is, can we just get rid of data that's fit, synthetic data that's fit to real data at all? Can we just create noise processes? Can we just create uh, procedural routines, uh, self-play, multi-agent competition, um, random statistical processes that just create training data without reference to the real world at all, except maybe via like our algorithmic design or some hyperparameters. Like, okay, sure, it's like uh, no free lunch, but it, uh, really minimal reference to the real world. So yeah, that's something I'm currently excited about. Yeah, maybe I can add to that actually, Philip. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up because yeah, uh, after I spoke, like everybody was talking about big data. And the reason I talked about like learning representation from scratch, things like that is I work with small data people in small data domains, right? Like, so scientists trying to work on, like they want to 3D print a thing. They still have a camera that's installed, but they need to be able to guide their 3D printer, right? You know, to get them the right configuration. They are really working with images, but that come from, you know, they just don't have too many of it. So how do you augment that? It's not just about transfer learning, right? These domains are very different. I mean, you can do a little bit of that, but I think you, we need to go much beyond that. So other things I will add to the list that Philip had was even, physical knowledge about the system, right? Like to get rid of data. How do we bring that? I mean, people have barely scratched the surface. Like they're starting to think about, okay, PDEs and ODEs and how do they help us extrapolate beyond the data? But there's much more, right? And much more, uh, like PD and ODEs are very well specified, right? Like we are talking about information or physical priors that may be misspecified, right? Or may uh, be present in very, maybe you only know about part of your system, right? But you can still use that knowledge. So when I talk about using all sources of information, it's not just different sources of data, but like prior knowledge, right? Uh, and whether it's coming from a sensing equipment, from an expert judgment, or just some from even like NLP books and stuff, right? Like how do we bring all of that to uh, bear at the problem at hand? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, I guess one question is, so it seems like a lot of people are talking about, you know, different types of supervision or, you know, I guess like physical, physics knowledge or GANs. Um, I guess the question is, have we solved how to leverage the data already? And now we're like just figuring out all the types of other sources of information or like, is there something beyond, you know, it, it seems like I think a lot of papers these days take you know, many different machine learning settings, like, you know, semi-supervised few shot and all those other ones. And then they take different combinations of existing things like entropy minimization, um, contrastive learning, self-training, all those kinds of things. And just kind of putting them together in different ways. Um, so I guess, have we kind of solved the fundamental problems of how to like actually use data and now we're thinking about just beyond like where to get the data from or are there still like open kind of fundamental problems in the methods themselves? Maybe that's too hard of a question. <laughs> yes, I mean, okay, uh, maybe I'll take a stab at it, which is, uh, no, it's true. Like, I don't think we are done with like, you know, analyzing the data and saying that, yeah, we've extracted everything we could because uh, while well, one, they, I, I mean, I think actually other people here are, I think more equipped to talk about that, like in real world scenarios, right? Like we don't know how to best use our data. We don't know what models work and how to make them work, right? Uh, how to uh, not just like, yeah, transform information and so on, but like how to realize we are making a mistake, right? And then go ahead and correct it, right? Or a mistake we have made in the past that has percolated through how to go ahead and uh, correct for those. 
um, again, how do, uh, I guess causality was a thing Philip brought up earlier, right? Like how to use that in machine learning models. Um, uh, that is that's still coming from data it's not like external thing we are bringing in right like the data encodes that information it's just about getting it out mm -hmm. uh, so i think yeah there are many many challenges um that still remain yeah i mean i guess i, I should uh, rephrase in the sense that like uh, you know on the academic data sets you know like self-supervised learning is is close or sometimes surpasses right like labeled learning uh when transferred to object detection for example from image net versus contrastive learning to to object detection so I guess under the you know standard you know in distribution academic data sets, um, it seems like we, we have really good algorithms that have made a lot of progress in the past only you know year 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 and a half. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Like applying it to the real world, which is much dirtier, is a harder problem. Yeah. Yeah, I want to chip in a few sentences here. So we just had another workshop on agriculture plus AI. And one of the topics we mentioned there is that um, uh, domain adaptation or transfer is really so important. And uh, it is seemingly working well for, for example, like uh, on cityscapes to synthetic data, but uh, on real world data, I mean, it's really for agriculture data and it's really difficult and challenging. So I guess um, first is uh, we're not done with playing with the current data sets yet, for sure, just like LT said. And uh, the other thing is really how to adapt this to the real world cases where these data are less standard. And uh, I mean, for example, we talk about agricultural multi-spectrum data, which is totally different from the RGB images we're playing with every day. And uh, even itself can be causing a lot of different uh, issues. Like one of our challenges, um, we, we hosted a, a challenge on uh, semantic segmentation for agricultural patterns. It turns out one of the best uh, entries this year is there doing some tricks with the normalization. So they go back to the original image and then they did the normalization, they improved the performance almost 10%, which was really amazing. So I do think um, this might be something we need to deal, I mean, it's a, it's really like a domain dependent and there's a lot of challenge, underlying challenges in the real world, real world applications. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, actually, Humphrey, since you brought up agriculture, I'll mention one thing that uh, we were recently talking about in the context of agriculture, right? So people use algorithms to make predictions, right? And they might use it to make predictions about like, okay, where to grow crops, right? And uh, what's the best, uh, like you can optimize the heck out of like, what are the environmental conditions, right? And all of that, what crop to grow, blah, blah, blah. But then ultimately, if you optimize too much, right? Like you have really used everything that was there in that land, right? And that the land becomes less productive. So yeah. there's a feedback loop here and that it appears in many, many problems, right? Wherever predictions are used to make, you know, uh, inform decisions, right, about what to do, then they go back and influence uh, the actions that people are taking. So they change the distribution of the data itself, right, in a way. Yes. Uh, I think example was brought up in the context of network traffic too, right? If you start predicting where traffic is low, right, and people start using that, those routers, then it becomes congested, right? So. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of feedback loops in the data that we just don't think about and model. And I think people are just starting to, uh, I think, recognize these things. I think more it's hard to work in this direction that made some initial uh, steps. But yeah, I think that's also another interesting direction. Yeah, I guess the good message here is that um, we're still at the beginning stage of tackling these problems. I mean, not at the end. So it's very exciting. Thanks. So just a random thought. Um, okay, I don't know anything about agriculture, but I, I think there's the concept of letting the field go fallow for a season so that it can replenish and then you come back and you plant new crops there. I wonder if there's an analogy that we should let some data sets go fallow and not touch ImageNet for a year so that we don't, you know, overfit to it or we get new ideas. I don't, this is a random, a random thought. <laughs> Oh, very cool thought. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I actually like that, that thought because I think what is happening a lot in our communities, we are overfitting to data. Um, things like you know, just out of my group, one of the things that we just tried recently was you know, taking one of those very well working classifiers that we, we trained in the computer vision community, and then you transfer it to other data sets. And some of the trends that we, 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 we have seen in papers just don't hold up on other data sets. So, you know, to, to some extent, we, we are overfitting to some of the data sets that we keep on overusing. 
So <laughs> uh, the, the idea that you brought up, Philip, resonates a lot. I, I think it, it would make a lot of sense to try to establish something of that sort. Yeah, and uh, actually for the, I mean, for overfitting, I think the best example is actually ImageNet, right? So, I mean, MIT did the survey that uh, there's a lot of uh, raw labels. I mean, actually in the past few years, probably other model improvement are based on wrong information. So that's a great example. And probably we should follow what Philip just said, we should totally get rid of data, maybe to some extent. Yeah, I'm not sure we could totally get rid, <laughs> rid of data. <laughs> yeah. that, that seems a little bit excessive, um, but yeah, certainly, looking more broadly or being more open to uh, data from other domains, uh, right? I mean, the, the, you mentioned the ACT domain, right? Uh, yeah. I think there's many domains out there, the ACT domain, the, the medical domain, um, and uh, maybe we need to look a little bit more broadly uh, yes. rather than focusing more too narrowly on just some, some very, very curated uh, data sets. Right. Can I different image net a little bit because <laughs> in my view, I think we haven't overfitted uh, image net yet. <laughs> yes, there is a paper coming out from um, MIT. They analyzed that there are some wrong labels, even in the validation and testing um, sets. So they have a, a new version called image net v2. And the, there is also a new data set coming out uh, image net real, basically uh, relabel the images. And there is also um, some aspects focusing on the robustness or output distribution of the models you train on ImageNet. So we got ImageNet uh, C and encryptions to ImageNet images and ImageNet R. R is basically some cartoon or some other RT images but belonging to the ImageNet categories. And uh, all the efforts so far I have seen is indeed as long as we can push the accuracy on the image net validation, we can also improve the robustness on the other data sets. And additionally, we can improve the transfer learning to some downstream tasks. So far, um, including the recent vision transformer models. So um, I was worried about image net um, actually in the moment I joined Google because we played with this data set really <laughs> extensively to the death. Um, but so far, the results are pretty positive. So like a data augmentation, new model architectures, new training algorithms, new robustness algorithms, all the new things coming out of the internet data set, they actually transfer. They transfer to other data sets and downstream tasks still. Um, I think the overfitting will come one day, um, but I think it's not there yet. Well, actually, the way I took Alex's comment was not just overfitting in terms of like getting my training accuracy to zero, but like we are overfitting to the ideas, right? And like, I mean, you're right that, okay, it might, whatever we learn tran um, transfers to downstream tasks, but not to completely different domains, right? Like it wouldn't work for 3D printing data sets. It wouldn't work for, you know, biomedical data sets necessarily. So uh, I think, yeah, the conceptually, I think we have overfitted much more than... <laughs> I agree. Yeah, the, the knowledge we learned on image lights certainly cannot transfer to arbitrarily different domains. Um, but unfortunately, the um, techniques or models, algorithms we learned or we discovered on image net, they actually transfer as far as um, I tell. Yeah. yeah, I'll give my low data example and say not necessarily, right? Like if, uh, I mean, if you're training on, yes, it will translate to maybe something which has another million images or right, whatever, but not to like, if you're working with hundreds of images, right? And you need to optimize something. Yeah, I guess both are correct. I mean, one of the things Alex was mentioning about, there's numerous methods which probably overfitting to some extent in terms of modeling, but uh, I mean, the transfer, Capacity of ImageNet is still very useful. Actually, we are far from uh, like done with ImageNet. Like uh, Bo Qing, you all work on the non tail ImageNet. I, I there's uh, still a lot of things we can explore there, even though it's not even the fourth ImageNet set yet. Yeah, I, I want to chime in. Like, uh, I, I guess there are like uh, one direction, which is like, uh, you know, we, we just are trying to leverage the fact that, you know, nowadays we have a lot of images uh, associated with a lot of text audio. 
and then that is actually uh, just uh, you know just happen at right now the this time uh, of the year. I mean, maybe like uh, twenty years or thirty years back uh, then, there might not be any uh, like uh, images uh, you know available. So maybe not uh, even associated with the videos or text. Um, yeah. So right now, like uh, like the methods like. Uh, like uh, I think a clip actually does show very well result, uh, you know, that you can took the clip and then trying to do some transfer learning and then you can get a really good result, result on the like a downstream test. I feel like that's like a really low hanging fruit for like a graduate student <laughs> or maybe interest to actually trying to get a papers in CVPR. Um, but uh, really on the other hand, uh, I mean, on the other uh, directions, like uh, really, uh, you know, we're trying to, uh, solve like a much harder problems, like uh, trying to tackle uh, like a different uh, domains, especially, uh, you know, you have like a billions of dollars of uh, self-driving car companies now trying to say, you know, we are solving the self-driving car for every single cities uh, uh, or not, right? So that's the, uh, I mean, that's the actual uh, like uh, industrial demands for this uh, kind of research. But uh, um, I guess we, we probably we are, we are still uh, a little bit far from there. Yeah. I guess, um, yeah, I don't know. There's one perspective, like the ImageNet, I think it's, there are many problems that ImageNet does not have that exist in the real world, right? So just by tackling ImageNet, you don't focus on some problems that exist externally. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of clip, um, I guess it's a question of like, should we just wait for scale? Should we just like combine all of the world's data wait for some open AI supercomputer and, you know, get really robust representations from that, that have like, you know, just the, the, the most general representation. Um, I think that that idea causes like a lot of consternation now in academic communities, because it's, you know, if we're just waiting for scale, then it, it's not as, as, as interesting <laughs> from the academic perspective, right? And so it's not clear, like, well, yeah, what, what are, do you think like if you just combine lots and lots of data all the way to trillions that includes agricultural, medical, self-driving, all those, and you just put it all into one pot, will you be able to learn some like very general representation? Or do you think it's not possible? I think it's not a, yeah, I mean, like right now with the current technology is not a possible, right? So just uh, to be fair. Well, like, yeah, I guess practically it's not, may not be possible. Is it not like, but, but if, if we had the compute, it, would it, would it lead to like basically better view shot, zero shot models? I, I think so. I hope that's actually good news for, um, for academic research. Like big companies have uh, clip uh, some aligned models uh, trend from trillions of um, amount of data. And then the model abstracts a lot of different knowledge. And Philip mentioned uh, generative models as an example, we could actually distill new, actually not new models, but new data from the model, such that we can have uh, additional capabilities for few shot or zero shot learning problems. Yeah. Also, Maybe <laughs> image lab because I haven't said enough for image lab, so I, I should take one step back because we have young audience, new generation here. I'm not actually trying to um, calling the attention to image net only. Certainly, that's not what not my my uh, intention. I'm, <laughs> I was just trying to defend a little bit for image net, but meanwhile, I want to echo Artis and Alex points that. We have actually a lot of real world, interesting new domains and new problems as well. So given the development in um, the image lab domain, certainly, hopefully we got new ideas and new insights and new tools to leverage for the new problems. Yeah, I mean, I guess to your point, there, there are a lot of open problems of give, given a clip model or whatever latest large scale model the industry trains, like how do you use it effectively and maybe like, you know, using various other methods, fine tune or intelligently pick out or distill or other way, otherwise analyze the information that it learned, right? Um, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead, right, go ahead. I don't know. I've spoken enough. Go ahead. All right. I'll, I guess I'll say quickly. Yeah. So one is I definitely 
I, I like to think of Flip as just the, the image net of 2020. So in 2000, and what was, I don't know what year, <laughs> image net came out uh, 2011 or 12. Um, and then you, you know, as a researcher, you don't want to collect a new image net. You just take that, that's the data and you can learn from it and you can distill knowledge from it. And now Clip came out in 2020 and we can, I, I don't want to make a new model of that scale, but I can take it as input to my system and I can distill from it. I can uh, train a small model on it. I can sample um, a generative version of it. Um, so that's that's one perspective. And then the other quick one I wanted to offer is that I do think that the fact that compute and money and data go so long a ways in getting the highest performance makes maybe that less interesting academically, at least for me personally. But it, it means there's other things that are interesting. So one reason I am really curious about trying to understand and move a little toward the theory land, um, even though you know, I'm, not, I'm not really in that land, but just toward the, let's try to understand these systems perspective is because, um, well, that's complementary to this. I'm not gonna be the one that makes the highest performing system on ImageNet or some benchmark because yeah, companies, whoever has the most scale will do that. But that's not enough, just performance is not enough. We need to understand these things. I mean, just for scientific curiosity, but also because socially it's important. You just know when they can go wrong, what the worst case is, how they can be biased, how they can make mistakes, uh, how we can create a society that really uses these robustly and meaningfully. Yeah, no, I think Philip actually covered my point. Uh, I was just gonna say that I don't think it's just like, that's not the end, right? That you just train on every possible domain that you have, right? Like uh, we might as well wait to, no, not even want to learn, right? Then you have like seen every possible example you can ever, but I think you're yeah, understanding these things. Yeah, he exactly hit the same point I was gonna make. I think I made a, maybe the easy point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to be a little controversial since I'm the, um, Actually, I have a maybe uh, another point to think about here is um, data, data and privacy. Are we going to move forward with this model that I guess worked reasonably well so far, which is uh, you know people offer their you know data almost for free. Um, and then, you know, we take advantage of it and, and learn models on it. Or is there a different route um, of um, offering algorithms and people can then use their own data to train their models uh, that, that they would want to use, right? For instance, just to make it concrete, think about uh, an agricultural context. Um, there are two options, right? One option is there's, uh, you know, a, a big corporation gathering a lot of data and then trying to solve problems um, and, and offer the solutions to people. The other, or, or to, to say farmers, the other option is, um, you know, offering um, algorithms and, and options or methods to farmers that can then on their smaller scale data try to gain the uh, insights that they need for themselves. And, and I think these are two you know, orthogonal directions, um, both of which have advantages. And uh, you know, one of them keeps the, the data private, uh, more or less private. The other one you know, requires to share data more broadly. And the, a similar, I guess, example could be used in a medical context. Um, you know, how much of the data are we willing to share? How much are we willing to give up for the benefits that we gain from that? And I think um, in, in a, in a small, small data or, or small labor data environment, that, that, that's an, an interesting question to discuss. Um, are we hoping to train models and find representations that capture everything from as much data as possible? Or should we actually go another route? Now, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I think it, it is at least one, you know, one question that I'm, uh, I'm every now and then thinking about. Yeah, and, and there's also, I mean, I guess industry I know is interested in like federated learning and things like that, where you might have many private 
silos of data and you want to try to share models and, and gradients or whatever for optimization. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting issues there. Um, okay, I don't want to cut off the conversation too much, but I know it's 6.50 uh, on the Eastern time, um, which is when we were supposed to end. Um, if there's any last kind of minute comments that anyone wants to provide, uh, feel free. Um, otherwise, yeah, I can. Uh, th thank you very much. That was an awesome conversation. I learned a lot. Uh, it's always great to hear um, kind of your perspectives. I appreciate all your time. I know it's Father's Day and late. So um, yeah, I, I really appreciate all your time and, and your insights that you provided. I think it's awesome for especially the young researchers. So, cool. Um, all right, yeah, thank you everyone. Um, th this workshop has been amazing. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure how this new format would go because usually it's just talks, um, but we are always afraid of running out of time, of, of not having enough questions. Um, and instead we always run out of time. So um, I really yeah, appreciate everyone's uh, participation um, and the poster session was great as well. All the materials are, is gonna be online. So um, we recorded all the panels uh, and everything. So we'll put that on the YouTube channel and everyone can continue to watch the videos. Like I said, it's, it's already really well watched. So um, all your talks have had amplified impact through YouTube. Um, so. It's great. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone's participation. Cool. Thank you. Bye, everyone. And I guess, Kyle, you can start. Stop recording. Okay. Uh, should we wrap up or that's it, right? Yeah, I guess stop the recording. Um, I don't know if it stops automatically. Mm, well, okay. <laughs>